Felipe Arruim. Olá, bom dia. Só, só um minuto, por favor. Hi, Stavros. Hi, Felipe Arruim. Good. <laughs> Great news. Yeah. Maybe the others are logged out. Maybe we need to send them a email to log in again. I don't know. I'm going to do it now. Pity. Is there anyone to give a signal to start? Peter, you can start. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone in Brazil. Good afternoon to the European audience. Well, I'm really sorry for the delay, but we stick today to the real world seminar tradition in Brazil, where seminars typically start a bit later than scheduled, but now we are here with all the energy and enthusiasm. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome you on behalf of CAMCBC and our president, Eleonora Coelho to today's webinar on the thrilling topic, contract interpretation and the controversial duty to renegotiate in times of crisis. My name is Peter Zester. I'm vice president of CAMCBC, which is Brazil's and Latin America's largest arbitration institution, both in terms of case filings and case values. By the way, in the background, you can see a picture of our marvelous uh, conference when you're in Sao Paulo that is waiting for the pandemic to end. Eu pessoalmente tenho muita saudade dessa sala maravilhosa. I hope you will enjoy what we have prepared for you and should you have any questions or comments along the way, please feel free to write us via the chat. Also the webinar will be recorded and will be soon available on CAMCBC's YouTube channel. First and foremost, it's an honor and privilege to share this panel with such renowned and sympathetic colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Marilda Rosado, Gloria Alvarez, Stafos Rekulakis, and Hamed Shalbaya for having accepted our invitation and for being with us today. A special thanks goes to Felipe Esperanjo. He had the idea and has taken the lead in shaping and organizing this webinar. Philippe, it has been a great pleasure to assist you. Furthermore, I would also like to thank CAMCBC's fantastic business development team, particularly its director, Lenora Hage and Mariana Meyer. I guess the pandemic kept you busier than ever. Unfortunately, we had to cancel in the last minute many international events you had already prepared. I'm just thinking about our Wismut court dinner, a conference during the Paris Arbitration Week, with Sherman Sterling and our sponsoring project of ICCA in Edinburgh. It is so great that you did not get frustrated and moved on uh, for the time being in the virtual world. Before I will hand over to Felipe, please let me say a few words about CAMCB's work over uh, the last couple of months. Almost four months passed since the day CAMCBC had to create an implement an emergency contingency plan. This was done literally overnight to guarantee the safety of employees and the continuity of our services. When designing this plan, CAMCBC realized 
that the necessary tools to adapt services to the online world had been already put in place over the years, but were not yet in full force. Therefore, CAMCBC adopted two administrative resolutions which provide for the reorganization of the institution and the rules for electronic processing of uh, proceedings. Under the leadership of our president, Eleonora Coelho, the institution's general secretary, Patricia Kobayashi, and her deputy, Luisa Kölmel, in cooperation with the renowned members of our advisory board, CAMCBC has done a terrific job. They deserve all the merits for the smooth transition of our arbitration proceedings to the virtual world. Today, more than 300 arbitration and mediation proceedings are being administered by our great case managers from their home offices. New filings continue strong. In addition to these achievements, CAMCBC has also supported social initiatives, which are combating worldwide the impacts of the pandemic. Today, we would like to invite you to do, donate to an invitation that you are surely very much uh, acquainted with. Médecins Sans Frontières, Médicos Sans Fronteras, Doctors Without Frontiers. MFS is an international independent medical humanitarian organization that provides medical assistance to people affected by conflicts, epidemics, disasters, or exclusion from healthcare. In Sao Paulo, for instance, MFS, MSF is running medical centers with a total capacity of 140 sick beds for homeless people, drug users, and the elderly. It goes without saying that any donation to this wonderful organization is highly welcome. For those interested, please access the website of MSF. You can see uh, the web address uh, on the screen. It will also be available on the webinars chat. Let me finish the preliminary words by introducing our multicultural panel to you. Marilda Rosada from Brazil, professor of private international law at the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. Gloria Alvarez from Mexico, professor of international dispute resolution at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Stavros Prekulakis from England, professor of international arbitration law at Queen Mary University, London. And last but not least, uh, no, first, ha, not to forget, Hamid Shalbaya from Egypt, partner of Sherman Sterling and member of its international arbitration practice in Paris. And last but not least, Felipe Sperangio uh, from Brazil, who is also based in London. He's senior counsel at Clyde & Co and member of its arbitration group. Felipe, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. I feel lucky to moderate a panel with five distinguished professors who are also experienced practitioners from a diverse range of legal backgrounds. This is the ideal recipe for a comparative and interactive discussion, which we hope to be complemented by questions from the audience at the end. We are living at strange times. Six months ago, no one could have predicted that we would be affected by a global, harsh, sudden event that would change the way we live and do business. Contracts in general could not, or at least not to a full extent, have envisaged and be prepared to deal with an event like COVID-19. In the absence of the parties' contractual agreements to deal with a particular event, the law governing the contract must provide the answers for the parties' disagreements. This is the situation that we are at, which has made the global legal community focus on the case law and jurisprudence related to contractual interpretation and to focus on the re legal remedies available to parties that are prevented from performing a contract as a result of events that they cannot control. This is our topic for today. 
when we think about a global pandemic, the first legal remedy that comes to any lawyer's mind is force majeure. Therefore, we would like to learn from the speakers how their jurisdictions treat force majeure. Is it a legal doctrine? Is it regulated and codified by the substantive law? Or is it left to the parties to agree and provide for it in their contractual clauses? Also, how relevant are attempts of the parties to mitigate their default of contractual obligations? Stavros, a research by Queen Mary, University of London, concluded that English law is the governing law in around 40% of the contracts in the world. The main reasons for such widespread use are arguably its predictability and its predisposition to enforce the party's bargain. So Stavros, could you please walk us through the notion of force majeure under English law? Well, thank you very much, Philippe. And more importantly, many thanks to CAMS, to CBC, Eleanor, Peter and Mariana. Uh, it is a pleasure to be virtually with all of you today. Well, speaking about force majeure under English law, one has to be very brief. And the reason being that this force majeure is not a legal doctrine or a, a, an accepted legal idea under English law. It is important to keep in mind what you just said, Philippe, that the main philosophy underpinning English law by tradition is to uphold parties' contractual arrangements. Any legal intervention outside the parties' contractual arrangements is alien to English law. And therefore, concepts such as force majeure and hardship have never been recognized doctrines in English law. Now, the main conceptual assumption for English law is that the parties must be able to address any risk associated with the performance of the contract at the contract itself, especially when we're talking about experienced, seasoned business people with some very uh, experienced legal representation. Now, however, con a contractual force majeure and hardship clauses are understood well and applied by English courts. And therefore, if the parties incorporate a force majeure clause into their contract, courts in England and Wales will give effect to it. But of course, the application of the force majeure clauses here will come because English courts will enforce it as a contractual term, rather because they accept that any change in the circumstances surrounding the contract, no matter how radical this change will be, can justify a revision of the party's contract. As for English law, everything is a matter of contractual risk allocation and whether an event will amount to force majeure is always a matter of interpretation. Now, I said that English courts will generally enforce force majeure clauses. This is correct. However, the thresholds to enforce it may be high and will not come automatically. Before an English court enforces a force majeure clause and release a party from performance, it must be satisfied that the party relying on the force majeure clause has taken all the necessary steps to mitigate the results of the force majeure event. This may sound as too onerous for the party relying on the force majeure clause, not least because a force majeure event is by definition an event falling outside the control of the party. However, for English law, while the event may be outside the party's control, there might be reasonable steps that the party could have taken in advance to avoid the consequences of that event, which consequences of that event under English court and law fall within the sphere of responsibility of that party. So typically the requirement of mitigation is something that needs to be upheld by an English court before enforcing a force measure contract uh, law. So the test for uh, reasonably, uh, reasonableness is a fact sensitive, is fact depending, and will introduce some flexibility for English courts. But that's the only inflexibility that English courts will allow about that. Thank you. Mohamed, how do you compare the notion of force majeure under French law to the notion under English law? 
Thank you, Felipe, and, and, and thank you. Uh, I joined Stavros in thanking you all uh, for this, uh, for organizing this webinar and, and thinking for it. It's a privilege to share this panel with you. Um, I, I, I have the controversial view that is especially controversial in our neighboring island, that is England, uh, that English law ultimately is not all that different from uh, continental uh, law in the solutions it reaches. Usually, there are, of course, one or two areas that are drastically, markedly different, but overall solutions tend to converge. And, and Fox Major is, is a good example. As, as Stavros was saying, English law does not have um, a similar doctrine, and it's all based on contractual terms. But the contractual terms that one sees in practice in almost all English law contracts have the lead to an ultimate result where the case law relating to Fox Major coming out of English courts, construing these Fox Major clauses, lead to solutions that are not all that different from the solutions that French law has adopted and other continental legal systems have adopted in Fox Major. Now that takes us to what did these systems adopt. I like to think of it more as in terms of impossibility, theories of impossibility, because under them, you have a number of doctrines. You have Fox Major in the strict sense. You have what's called the fortuitous event. You have the Fédé Prince, so the act of government and act of God. So all of them ultimately are theories that allow you in the face of four conditions, uh, which join the conditions that Stavros have noted uh, coming out of the contractual practice of party under English law, which are you need an external event that is not within, within that of the debtor or the debtor's agents, um, an unforeseeable event that you could not have assumed the risk of at the time of concluding the contract, and an irresistible event i.e. that you could not mitigate, which joins the mitigation duty that Stavros was noting uh, by taking reasonable steps to mitigate its consequences. And then ultimately, fourthly, the, re the fourth condition that this event have, have feature, having these features have rendered the performance of the obligation in question impossible. Once these conditions are met, the debtor is relieved of its obligation to perform. And that's a general principle under French law. You will find it in contract law under the name of the theory of impossibility, but you will find it in criminal law. You'll find it in every, almost every branch of the law on the theory that the law cannot force the impossible. So if you reach that high threshold of impossibility, then you're relieved from performing your obligation. Now there is impracticality and theories that cover impracticality, uh, such as hardship, but I'll leave those aside because I know we'll get to them. Um, so yes, yeah, so on the French law, these theories have, have always been existed in the case law. They've been codified uh, in the old code and now under the 2016 reform of the French civil code have been amended, but ultimately only to integrate the case law solutions uh, that I've just told you that emerged over the years. There is no real, uh, nothing new to Fox Major per se, it's just a new provision of the code that sets it out in clearer terms. Um, but the solution is always, if performance is impossible, you're relieved from, from, from performing that obligation to the extent you could not mitigate it. Uh, so it's not an automatic bonus. You can't you can just say, oh, there is the pandemic, therefore I don't have to perform the contract. You always have that duty of causation that you see in practice. Parties tend to forget sometimes. You have to show how precisely this event that is incontestably a general and, and irresistible one has actually prevented you as a party from discharging your duty. Thank you, Mohamed. And following up on those additional remedies besides force majeures, what would be those legal remedies that have gained center stage during the COVID-19 crisis? How do these legal remedies differ from force majeure? I understand from you that they may lead to the, the same outcome, but are there different steps and tests to be met? Uh, Stavros, 
what maybe, maybe we can hear from Stavros in relation to English law and then we compare to the position under French law. Yeah, thank you, Felipe. I think Mohammed said something which is very interesting. He said that the general view, the general legal theory doctrine under uh, French law is that you cannot force the impossible. And that's true. But English law never recognized traditionally this theory. English law never had a doctrine of impossibility, subsequent impossibility, until uh, relatively recently, a couple of, um, of centuries ago, until the 19th century, English law didn't recognize, which is a strange thing. And therefore, I think this is where the main, I would say, difference between English law and other laws lies. It is the mind frame that has developed in the common law that the theory of subsequent impossibility came very late and therefore hasn't affected the legal tradition in the same way that traditional French law, Germanic traditions of uh, continental law has been imbued by the theory that you cannot force the impossible. This is an alien theory, an alien concept for English law. Now, what else is there except force majeure, you ask, Felipe? It is a frustration, the uh, legal doctrine of frustration. But again, the test for frustration in England is very narrow. Uh, English law and English courts have said, and I quote, a contract will be viewed as frustrated if A, is objectively assessed an event that occurs which makes the contract physically be and commercially impossible to perform or makes C, the obligation, radically different from what was agreed by the parties and D, that would be, as a result, adjust unjust and unfair to hold the parties to the original obligations. So look at the wording, objectively assessed, physically or commercially impossible, perform something radically different and be unjust for one of the parties. This is a very high threshold for a party to prove if it wants to rely on frustration. And that has been held many times by English court. I will only, if you allow me, refer to a very recent case to illustrate the point, the case is Canary Wharf against the European Medicine Agency that was decided by the English um, High Court. You may know that as a result of Brexit, the European Commission decided to move the European Medicines Agency outside London. And so the agency had a 25 year lease in place uh, for the headquarters that was at that point in London. And then they say, we want to terminate the 25 year lease because Brexit is, makes the performance impossible. Now English courts held that the, doctrine, that the Brexit was not a frustration, a frustration event. Well, it might have been very frustrating for everyone in living in London, but it wasn't a frustration event. Now English courts said that while Brexit was itself not foreseeable as a reason for vacating the premises of the lease, the parties had contemplated in their contract the possibility that the agency might leave before the term of the lease, but nevertheless, the agency assumed the risk of taking a 25-year lease without a breakout clause in return for some deduction in the price. So therefore, the court concluded that the parties' contract is to be performed as it was originally agreed. Now, if Brexit and the move of the agency outside London is not an event that makes the performance of the lease impossible, I'm not sure I can think one of. But again, that it, it reflects the unwavering focus of English courts on the four uh, corners of the contract. Now you mentioned, Philippe, and I will close with it, what is the difference between force majeure and frustration? Well, the scope of application is different. For example, frustration requires that the parties are relieved from the uh, eventual performance. Whereas force majeure, as we will have the opportunity to discuss later on when it comes to fitting contracts, can also provide for a pause, a hiatus on the performance. This is not the case under frustration. Frustration just gives the option for the parties to um, terminate the contract. The second difference is that the more unforeseeable and catastrophic the event, the more likely that this is to be classified as a frustration event rather than as a force majeure event. And you need to remember here that under English law, 
if the parties have included a force majeure clause in their contract, it is impossible, it is unlikely that frustration doctrine will apply. So the more broader the scope of a force majeure clause in an English contract, the less scope for frustration to apply exists. Uh, but I would say that in a pandemic event, such as the one that we currently experience, the COVID-19 with the international scope and all the consequences that have um, uh, brought upon us, it is interesting to see whether English courts will have the opportunity to classify it as a frustration event. Thank you. Mohamed, would the French courts set the test as high as the English courts? No, no, I, uh, and, and, and that's, that's uh, as a general tendency, uh, they would not. And I think that the French courts and, and, and legal systems that follow the French tradition tend to have a sliding scale of solutions when you're faced with uh, an event such as, as the current pandemic. Uh, first, you have impossibility, right? And that's what we've discussed in the prior point. And the theories are on impossibility. So that's your first item in the checklist. So let's say you don't need that test. You have a general event, you have the pandemic, but the pandemic has not really made performance impossible. So in Stavros's example, Clearly, the, you know, it's not impossible to keep the building. They can keep the lease. They just have no real economic use of it, but it's not impossible to perform the lease agreement, right? So you go down a step. So if you don't, so to me, that's not force majeure, even under the French you know, definition, even under the continental definition, that wouldn't be force majeure. Um, force majeure would be of the English, you know, if the British government told them, you can no longer occupy this premises. You're kicked out. But that would be fair. You can't, that would be impossibility, right? But there, it's, it's not really um, force majeure, even under the French system. You go into in, in the French system, you go down level and the sliding scale to impracticality. So, the, so the, the, it's what the French would call the theory of imprévision, and, and hardship, and what, what was commonly referred to in English as hardship. Now, hardship uh, has long been not recognized by French law uh, in the contract, in the private law sphere. It has long been a theory of public law, of French administrative law, that has been rejected in the commercial private sphere uh, for the past centuries, like going all the way back to the Napoleon Code until the 90s. Only in the early 90s, the French Code of Cassation started to soften up and accept the notion that, well, if, even if performance is not impossible, but if the general event has made performance extremely onerous, such that the economic equilibrium of the contract has drastically shifted, not just became a little more less profitable, but it has to have drastically shifted, then you can, the court can intervene and readjust the terms of the contract. Uh, the French did not really have any provision to deal with that in the code, in the civil code for private relationships. In the 90s, the Code of Cassation started to implement that um, hardship concept under the duty of good faith. And then with the 2016 reform of the French civil code, it has formally adopted it as part of French private contract law um, and now the steps are, if such an event, so it still has to be unforeseeable, it still has to be general and external, and if it upsets the balance of the contract in such a way that the parties have a duty to renegotiate, if they don't reach an agreement, the judge can intervene on the motion of one of the parties and adjust the terms of the contract so that the imbalance is not so severe. And then I leave other theories of the sliding scale to later on. Thank you. Peter, how do you compare those positions to German law? Are they sufficiently different that the law applicable to the contract can bring a different outcome to the parties? <laughs> 
Well, both under German and Brazilian law, force majeure has a complementary function in the sense that it sets aside the responsibility of the obligor for a lack of performance. While the Brazilian legislator adopted a general norm on force majeure, Article 393 of the Brazilian Civil Code, the respective German code only mentions force majeure in specific situations such as suspension of limitation periods. However, the German courts have developed a legal doctrine that corresponds pretty much uh, to the Brazilian statutory law. Like most civil codes, the German and the Brazilian one distinguish between non-performance due to impossibility and default to perform timely, mora or retard in French. In both cases, however, um, the obligor is obliged to pay damages for breach of duty, provided that she or he is responsible for that breach. As said before, force majeure excludes responsibility of the obligor. Using this as a starting point, I would like to highlight two issues which are relevant uh, in the con context of the pandemic, in my uh, humble view. Where is the borderline between a default to perform timely and impossibility? And how do we separate impossibility and the doctrine on interference of the basis of the transaction, falta da baso negocio in Brazil? Both Brazilian and German law recognize this doctrine, which was developed by the German Superior Court of Justice in the aftermath of the First World War. But let us start with the first question and example. Traditionally, Germany maintained strong relationships with Iran. When the Islamic Revolution started in the late 1970s, the performance of many contracts was simply interrupted. And it was not clear if and when the interruption would end, like, just like lockdowns. Actually, the Western world believed in the beginning that the revolution would not be sustainable. In the light of this uncertainty and the lack of a time frame, the German courts rule that non-performance should be classified as impossibility and not default. And now where's the borderline between impossibility and lack of interference of the contract's basis? This is even trickier. Impossibility may be, at least subject to German law, divided in three subcategories factual, legal, and economic impossibility, which probably rather corresponds in French law to what Hamid called uh, impracticability. The latter subcategory, economic impossibility, addresses is the issue of excessively onerous performance, which is also an element of the doctrine on the lack of the contract's basis. Impossibility is a very radical solution which does not preserve the contract's purpose nor the business relationship. That is why, for instance, the Brazilian legislator adopted in articles 478 and 479 of the Civil Code, a mechanism which allows an adaptation of long-term contracts in case of excessively onerous performance. The OBG can avoid the resolution of the contract by offering an adaptation of the contract to the obligor. Under Brazilian law, different from German law, Contract resolution requires a lawsuit against the obligor and not just a simple declaration as in German law. The offer to adapt the contract is therefore in Brazil designed as a defense tool in court proceedings. Hence, at the end of the day, the judge will decide whether or not the offer of the obligee provides for modification that corresponds to equity and fairness. The approach of the doctrine on the lack of the contract's basis works differently. Here, the judge will adapt the contract straightforward. The doctrine was uh, developed to pres uh, preserve contracts and business relationship in the case of an exogenous shock which erodes the economic basis of the contract. The German courts applied the doctrine first uh, in the aftermath of the World War I and the Iranian Evolution in the 17th, in the late 17th. However, it is important to note that war revolution or pandemic as such are not a legal doctrine. The term calls always required an additional element. In the case 
of World War I, it was the hyperinflation and the radical changes of all life circumstances. And in the case of the Iranian Revolution, it was the radical change of the Iranian legal system. For instance, prohibition to sell alcohol. The pandemic is definitely an exogenous shock, which in my opinion will lead in the months to come to dramatic changes in the Brazilian econo economy, both on the macro and microeconomic level. So the doctrine will eventually in some cases be applicable. Well, I still need to name the legal basis of the doctrine. Under both German and Brazilian law, it's the principle of good faith. So, and I think this gives you room for the next question. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. In fact, the principle of good faith is the foundation of many civil law legal systems. So how have the national courts applied or are likely to apply the principle of good faith in the interpretation of contracts affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Marilda, we would like to hear your views, please. Hello, uh, my regards to everyone. Thank you for the organizers. I'm so happy to be in this panel for all the reasons that I am sure everybody will agree after one before, and also because of the order of the presentation, I'm so lucky to speak right after Peter, because I always say, with his German and Swiss background, is the one that's most knowledgeable about Brazilian law that I know. So I can just fit in and comment and go a little step, uh, a little step further, perhaps, of what Peter uh, introduced. It's so interesting because exactly he showed uh, from an international law professor point of view, we're always focusing uh, the comparative approach. And what we realize in the past decades, maybe uh, the 21st century uh, brought more awareness concerning this uh, comparative comment that I'm going to, to make, that not only those traditional systems or traditionally viewed as hybrid are hybrid. hybrid. And if, if we talk about international contracts, we we'll always realize that because of the sources of law that are found in soft law, in international arbitration, international business practices, we have a bridge. That's why I was uh, much in agreement when Mohammed initially commented that maybe the results in English law, English uh, courts were not so different from French because now we have this common ground. But in what concerns your question in Brazil, there was a big uh, change of paradigm with our constitution in uh, 1988 and with the radical change in the civil law doctrine. I know that uh, we'll have more discussions later. I don't want to, 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 to uh, have the intention of covering everything, but at least I would like to raise uh, some uh, doctrinal views that uh, after the civil code of 2002 in Brazil, maybe in that regard, we were vanguard because, you know, the principle of good faith and objective good faith uh, got a very important status in our law. And specifically in my university, I have to render the honor to my colleagues from civil law in a, a Rio de Janeiro State University that's considered even a school of thought in Brazil at the constitutional uh, uh, civil law. And I could name a few, but maybe I could name Gustavo Tepedino, Carlos Edson, uh, Anderson Schreiber, Guilherme Calmon. These four I name because they have already written about the effects of COVID and these questions of good faith. But to try and be fair, I could also mention that 
uh, in my uh, studies, it's very important, this research group that I created about the good faith. And for instance, there is a very well-known professor of civil law, Judith Martins Costa, another day, very recently in a debate, she mentioned something that you just mentioned, Felipe, that the good faith is the founding basis for renegotiation. But I am aware that I shouldn't uh, spend too long. Of course, I would have more to, to talk about. Uh, we had, I would like only to mention that uh, last year in our Congress of International Law in Brazil, I presented a paper with two former students who are already professors, uh, Eli Caetano Xavier Jr. and Fernanda Volpon, and we studied good faith in the pre-contractual phase. So I would say this is important, not only for exams of incidents of onerous uh, 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 facts and legal basis after the contract is signed, but also in pre-contract. Thank you for the time being. Thank you, Marilda. And we now move on to perhaps the most important point of this webinar. That is, how are the parties expected to behave in times of crisis? For example, the UK government has issued guidance urging companies to avoid damaging lawsuits and to resolve their contractual disputes relating to COVID-19 through mediation and negotiation before rushing to the courts. Is there a duty to renegotiate contractual terms? Or is there a limitation on the right of a party to enforce a contractual right during a crisis? Peter. What are your views? If there is a duty to renegotiate, what would be the source of that duty? So, sorry. Thank you, uh, Felipe, for this uh, thrilling question. And it's a great pleasure to talk right after Marilda, who gave me one of the first opportunities to, to uh, give a class at WERG back in 2006 and 2007. But let me start answering this question by emphasizing that the Brazilian Superior Tribunal of Justice, the STJ, has repeatedly held that commercial contracts between two entrepreneurs or commercial legal entities should be interpreted not in the same way as contracts involving non-professional parties or consumers. Thereby, the SDJ has strengthened party autonomy and the principle of pacta sunt servanda in commercial contracts. The presidential decree 881 of 2019, which meanwhile has been transferred to statutory law, aims to strengthen the economic freedom of parties, in particular, by restricting judicial intervention in commercial contracts. And this is a crucial point in the context of boa fe, or good faith. The new articles 420 and 421a foster party autonomy, particularly by preserving risk allocation established in contracts between commercial parties. However, some Brazilian academics, and uh, Marilda mentioned some of them, probably inspired by the principles of European contract law developed by the Lando Commission in the 90s and early years of the centuries are recently promoting the existence of an obligation to renegotiate contracts in case of force majeure, for instance. The theory is based, as it was already mentioned, on the good faith Article 422 of the Brazilian Civil Code, which has an extraordinary relevance in Brazil, even when compared with other civil law countries such as Germany, which has a long tradition and is uncertain, unfortunately, in my opinion, certain enthusiasm for corrective justice based on good faith. Due to this tendency, which includes commercial contracts, German contract law lost its competitiveness over the last decades vis-a-vis -vis English law in particular. We heard this before. 
ICC statistics demonstrates this clearly. However, as a matter of fact, Brazilian law is not exposed to the same regulatory competition as national contract laws in Europe. The reasons are manifold and include policy and economic issues as uh, well as uh, legal obstacles to choice of law. Therefore, Brazil has more space to pursue a separate way. Against this background, it's not surprising that the new Brazil, in theory, goes even beyond the French and the German law on renegotiations. Actually, it promotes a seek to construct an obligation in the strict sense, which means that if renegotiations fail, a claim for compensatory damages might be the consequences. Infer influential academics, as mentioned by Marilda, Professor Judith Martins Costa, take, however, a critical view on the new theory which I personally share because it extrapolates the dogmatic borderlines of the good faith principles, which serves the function to limit the exercise of contractual rights, thereby protecting legitimate expectations of fairness in business relationships. Using the good faith principle to construct a primary obligation to renegotiate combined with a non-performance sanction, a claim for compensatory damages, puts two pillars of Brazilian contract law at risk, Pacta Sunt Servanda and party autonomy. A renegotiation duty in combination with a non-performance sanction results in effect in an obligation to celebrate a contract modification. In the light of the two pillars, an obligation to celebrate a contract is only justified in two situations. One party has a monopoly or provides for an essential services such as electricity supply. In the light of professional deal-making and also the Harvard concept of negotiations, it's also very doubtful that establishing legal obligations to negotiate is of any use. Consensus is built on mutual trust and a rational win-loss analysis by both parties. The emergence of consensus cannot be forced by the law. Last but not least, transaction lawyers have the skills to avoid facts that could enable a judge to condemn their client to pay damages for violating in an abusive manner the principle of good faith if renegotiations fail to produce a consensus. The bar for such a claim based on Article 187 is in practice very high and the burden of proof almost unsurmountable. If renegotiations were done seriously and have been fully documented, the theory, in my personal view, is counterproductive because it creates a breeding ground for ever more disputes. What is the benchmark for poor and abusive renegotiation efforts? How to calculate damages? How to prove the nexus of causality between poor negotiation efforts and damages? Because it's about the nexus because between poor negotiation efforts and damages, not between the pandemic and uh, damages. So more problems than solutions. That's my view on that. Thank you, Peter. I share your views. Mohamed, are there tools for facilitating the contractual renegotiation in times of crisis and could those tools be imposed on the parties? Thank you, Felipe. Yes, I join you and Peter in, 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 um, in a distaste to an obligation of renegotiation. And I think, um, and, and French law, for example, has adopted that. There's no real duty to renegotiate. You either fit the conditions or you don't. So, you know, performance is impossible, you get force majeure. Or, or it's not, then you don't. Uh, performance is extremely onerous, but it, and, and I underline extremely. Hardship properly construed, it's not just, I would have made this margin and now making a smaller margin, or even I'm making a loss. It needs to be economically ruinous. If it's economically ruinous, then you don't really have an obligation per se to negotiate. It's just that if you don't, the other party might ask the judge to rebalance the contract. So you take a risk. So your, your duty to, so let's say your incentive to renegotiate 
is the fact that you know if you do not come up to a bargain that both of that sort of restores a little bit of economic equilibrium to the contract the judge might do it for you and you might be worse off so it, it it's more of a soft law incentive um, but again you still have to fit the, the the criterion which is that the performance has become ruinous economically ruinous even if not impossible outside of that there is no real incentive or duty to renegotiate under French law that comes directly. Now that doesn't mean it will not come indirectly. And, and, and you see that in, in two ways. One way is the some number of systems that have put moratorium on the ability to bring a claim. That sort of by definition incentivize the parties to renegotiate in the meantime. Other ways, and that's a recent uh, case, and this one is not French, it's a US case, interestingly, a uh, US district case from the uh, District of Columbia that refused to enforce an exit award that was issued against the state. In June, the, 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 district, the DC court said, in view of the fact that this exit award is subject to annulment proceedings, I'm not going to enforce it right away, even though I can. I'm going to wait for the setting aside process to be over because I don't want to burden the state at a time of a pandemic. So this is not really force majeure. This is not really a prévision or hardship or what have you. This is the law intervening in a more subtle way putting a pause on the relationship of the parties. Now you can imagine the state and the investor now having a year and a half or however long, how long the normal proceedings will take, will certainly renegotiate. And, and, and you know, any, any rational economic actors will. So even though this is not a formal duty, it is a soft law mechanism pushing the parties to renegotiate through other means. Thank you, Mohamed. That's a very interesting decision and a surprising outcome, I would say. And we can take the opportunity to shift to the investment law perspective, which I believe is of particular interest for a Brazilian audience because Brazil is an outlier when it comes to a legal framework specifically designed to protect foreign direct investment. Gloria, from the investment law perspective, what is the rationale and the process behind risk planning? What are the specific precautions that the parties can take to achieve a commercial balance and to make their contractual position less vulnerable to disorders? Thank you, Felipe. Um, obviously, I have to say hello and good morning, good afternoon to everyone um, at Cannes and CCBC. I don't have the pleasure of uh, knowing Eleonora or Patricia, but I congratulate them for all their hard work. And obviously, thank you to uh, Mariana and Peter and to you, Felipe, for masterfully organizing this very interesting event. Um, and of course, a uh, very fraternal uh, greetings to all the audience. I see a lot of uh, friendly names as attendees, so I send them very kind regards. Well, when, when you gave us the introduction, Felipe, you talk a lot about how we were six months uh, before today and now. And I could not stop thinking that, as a matter of fact, in Latin America, we are pioneers on crisis. You know, we have faced financial crisis, political crisis, modern uh, shapes, uh, modern figures of dictatorships. And if you think about it, uh, Uruguay had a very rigorous uh, health crisis in the sense of uh, combating a lot of the tobacco smokers. So there is a lot of examples already of how we handle crisis in international arbitration and international investment law. And I will not say that uh, Brazil is an outlier. To the contrary, Brazil has been a pioneer at generally blending issues of public law with private law. 
we see a lot of arbitration uh, uh, processes where you bring either the state or a state entity to arbitration. And that you cannot avoid to, do, to, to do not have a blend of public law and private issues that meet there. And then it's the obligation of the arbitration tribunal to handle them. And this is where I come from. Um, and I would like to really tease out how these different issues interact um, in terms of context and instruments. So first, we, we have this set of instruments that we know, probably, we have heard of, that are international investment agreements. And very similar to English law, uh, we really don't consider these instruments that really don't have force majeure or hardship provisions. But what they do offer are different provisions that you could say they are similar or they can be used for, for the similar effects, which you have an equitable treatment. So which essentially, you know, academics don't agree on the definition, but an equitable treatment is a, essentially a guarantee to do not change the law, to do not change the policy, and, and things will stay as they are throughout the duration of a contract. You also have stabilization clauses, which essentially freeze the law, but very importantly, they freeze the law as the date you finish negotiating the contract. So those, those are the two very common instruments you will have in international investment agreements. But also, you have something very important, which are investment contracts, meaning you have contracts where you have a state entity and a private company, an investor. A very good example of those are production sharing agreements. And a lot of months, in reality, they don't have one single format like the Red Book on FIDIC, you know, production sharing agreements will reflect a lot of the legal culture and the context and the industry of which those uh, were signed. But production sharing agreements, what they will have is that they will usually offer an oscillation between force majeure, hardship provisions, all the way to have nothing and really be very strict and respect what we know as pacta sunt servanda. You know, this is it, this is what you agree and this is what you have. But it is very important to understand that there is something in the middle. And that thing in the middle is what we are talking about today, which are the renegotiation clauses. Now, renegotiation clauses will become and are becoming more and more importantly in the context, in this uh, hybrid context of public and private law. Because, as I said uh, when I started, there are political, there are economic changes, but also there are, most importantly, there are a lot of social changes happening, affecting investments, especially in, in the energy sector, but not only on the, in the extractive industries, but also in the electricity markets. We have seen a lot of, for example, um, indigenous groups, local communities, frustrating an electricity project somewhere in Chile, somewhere in Mexico, somewhere in Brazil. So therefore, there is not only the political or the economic usual suspects we are scared of facing, but also there are social aspects that will become more and more prominent, especially in our region. So how do we handle that? How, how, how do we kind of control them in this type of investment contract? Well, I mean, Mohamed and Estados talk about this balance about being how precise you have to be and how broad you have to be. And I, I really like how both of them offer these very similar and important concerns. And I also kind of summarize in a sense that, um, you know, you should not have uh, empty shells. You should really be offering something in the contract. So what you will expect to see in investment contracts, sometimes, although debatable, you will see first a list of which are those triggering events. But then again, as Stavros mentioned, the more catastrophic they are, the less likely you will mention them in the contract. So, you know, you, you mentioned these trigger events, but to what extent you mention them all. Um, then also you will have the contents of the renegotiation process. This is very important. Whether if the outcome of renegotiating is successful or not, we should really have a process oriented approach when drafting the contracts. And therefore we should perhaps include if it is a normal industry practice to have negotiations. In the uh, gas pricing disputes, we know that it's very common that parties will sit down and talk about it, will renegotiate the prices. 
And um, we will also expect that, for example, in renegotiation, you will seek uh, expert advice. And also when you are renegotiating, it is important not only to put forward your position, but to give the reasons for that. And I will, I know perhaps Spirit has a sim similar uh, recommendations, but there are these recommendations of UNCITRAL guide on drawing, drawing up contracts, which are very, very useful and knowing what you have to put when renegotiating a clause. And lastly, but not least, I think it is important to be clear whether if, what is what we want. Is it a simply a duty to renegotiate or also you have higher expectations and it's not only a duty to renegotiate your contract, but a duty to achieve an agreement. Um, and the, clear, the clearer this is in the contract, the easier it will be for the arbitration tribunal. Because if we don't know what we want from these renegotiation clauses, we are leaving to the arbitration tribunal a very difficult uh, task and you know we can enter into other discussions like them going beyond their powers thank you gloria and can you give us some examples on how arbitral tribunals have faced and decided unforeseeable events yes of course i mean i as I, as I say earlier, and I really want to underscore um, this, because we are in this mix of private and public international law, you are not going to see hardship or force major provisions explicitly in, in, in the investment um, context. It, but what I have seen quite a lot, especially if the dispute comes from an international investment agreement, you will see that arbitration tribunals will use the only draw principles on international commercial contracts as a, as a compass for decision making. So they will use it to verify if certain principles are valuable and are acceptable. And I will give you an example of this. Two very interesting cases. It was a coincidence that both of them are against Argentina. I did not choose them on, on purpose. The first one is El Paso versus Argentina. This was a case that arose in the financial crisis in 2000. Um, there was, an, as we know, there were emergency financial measures enacted by the Argentinian government. And the applicable law was a combination of Argentinian national law and international law. Argentina argued that the financial measures were due to the law of necessity. The law of necessity for the public international law lawyers is a very com common concept that you use for in terms of war, very, very harsh situations. But Argentina equated the financial crisis to a time of necessity, and that's the reason they had to change the laws. The tribunal knew that the threshold of war perhaps is too high, so they had to look somewhere else, and they look into the only draft principles. And I really like this case because it's a genuine uh, meeting between private and public international law, and it really shows how difficult sometimes it is to, to deal with a private investor and the state. But what the tribunal did is that they wanted to test if Argentina was in control or not, or affecting this state of necessity. To do so, they look into the force major and hardship principles to test if Argentina uh, was beyond, everything that happened to the economic crisis to Argentina was beyond Argentina's control and liability. Um, and they use, they, they very, very basically, they say they, are, they divided the test into two. The first, whether if the party had contributed to the state of necessity. And they also, really emphasize on UNIDRA because they say that UNIDRA are these general principles of civilized nations and, and where necessity, if you contributed to necessity, you cannot be exempted from liability. Um, and then at the end, of course, the arbitration tribunal, and then again, as Stavros mentioned earlier, sometimes the thresholds are too high. And therefore they decided that Argentina was not in a situation of force major, that as a matter of fact, they were themselves the ones who planned their financial strategy, and therefore, you know, they have to be liable in this context. Conversely, in this very same financial crisis, there is another case as Suez versus Argentina, where the tribunal reached a very different outcome. And with this, I will, I will uh, finish, Felipe. Um, there was a concession contract 
and the concession contract was itself renegotiated under the Argentina Public Emergency Act. And the investor actually argued that renegotiation was against stability. So this renegotiation was a breach of fair and equitable treatment. And that's what the arbitration tribunal concluded. My own opinion, and I think uh, Mohammed mentioned it or Peter earlier, and Marilla actually, and you Felipe mentioned it, is that renegotiate is a manifestation of good faith. And this is something that, for example, in this case, the arbitration tribunal failed at seeing. And also, very interesting and very importantly, although, as I said earlier, it is not part of the contracts, what I like of uh, the UNIDRA principles is that we see them more and more keep coming up in investment treaty cases to corroborate what is the, whether it's the decision-making process of the arbitrators is the accurate. And I will predict, I will dare to predict that this will be something that we will continue to see and simply because we see a bigger trend on, um, on bringing claims between private companies and state entities. Thank you, Gloria. Heavy construction and infrastructure has been one of the most affected industries by the crisis. Delays in large projects, including oil and gas projects, are usually associated with liquidated damage claims, contractual penalties, or claims for loss of profits. This is an industry where the allocation of risk is critical, meaning that force majeure clauses are usually meticulously negotiated. Marilda, how have you seen the pandemic affecting the oil and gas industry? Uh, Felipe, thank you for your question. And again, I'm very lucky because I'm speaking right after Gloria. And thank you for your remarks concerning this mixture of public and private uh, views, uh, public law and private law. I always say that uh, having as a background my 40 years practice in the oil and gas law uh, has turned me into a different kind of international law professor. I'm a private law professor, but I never have just really separate views. And more and more, uh, I try to bring together the academic and the practical point of view. So coincidentally, before the pandemic, I was four months at the Max Planck in Hamburg. I was very lucky to have a senior uh, scholarship to do my research on complex contracts. And why do I mention it? Because exactly, if you, apply all these concepts to complex contracts in the energy industry complex contracts, you have a very complicated scenario. So if you mention the situation of the onshore production, for example, in the United States, the problems were hard enough, but then the producer himself can take the decisions like, the shut-in of a well to diminish the production, to face the crisis, because one would think, would think such an important uh, element like energy, and here I speak not only oil and gas, but overarching energy resources. We had a, a forecast from the Energy Agency to 2030, and that's still valid, because no recalculation, uh, we hadn't time for recalculation yet, that it would reach 26 trillions. So that affects human life as a whole. And also during the pandemic, it's essential for all the other areas, even for the logistics. So it's that self-explanatory. But that's the only uh, request that I would make to Mariana if I can share uh, two view graphs uh, that are in the 
end of the view graphs that I provided her, because I want to show you why, if we are not talking about onshore production, if we are talking about offshore production, the crisis that had to be dealt with, either by private operators and the associates or by the governments, the challenge was much more complex. Because here we talk, and that's the coincidence that I mentioned, of complex contracts that at the private level are so intertwined that if you talk about a crisis that is such a radical effect in all the supply chain, when you're dealing with one contract, you have to deal along the chain with the impact of that crisis. And in the case of the oil and gas industry, for example, there are ancillary industries that are complementary. So I participated in a seminar in USP two weeks ago that was promoted by the Energy Institute. And there, coincidentally, I read an article about the maritime industry, talking about the number of people that are circulating those ships that are related to, to the oil industry, but because of the marketing side. So that's very challenging. So if I don't have the, the slides to share, no problem. Maybe we have time uh, during the debate. But that means that just sophisticated production structures in the offshore, they give a uh, much, uh, a rather technical challenge and if I can speak a final word, that when you talk about default, you usually you talk about cross default along the chain, a, a, a very complicated uh, uh, situation, even to talk about renegotiation. So I, I think I already passed my time. Thank you. Thank you, Marilda. Stavros, with respect to large construction projects, how do the FIDIC contracts address and provide for a model force majeure clause for the industry? We, we spoke earlier, Felipe, that force majeure under English law is a contractually regulated um, doctrine. Uh, we need to remember that FIDIC rules are essentially originating from the English legal tradition. The English legal tradition of engineering and um, uh, construction law. So it's therefore natural that FIDIC contractually regulates force majeure in the previous edition, uh, the well-known Clause 19. Now again, because it's an English tradition and I talked about the duty to mitigate the duty to mitigate is also to be found in clause 19 of the previous FIDIC rules, 19.3, which uh, also provides for two main consequences. If force majeure event is uh, determined by a tribunal or by a national court, then there are two main effects of it. Uh, either the contractors can claim extension of time and prolongation costs, and in the event that the force measure has prevented the contractor from performing for a period which is less than 84 days, or if that period is beyond, the force majeure period is beyond, extends beyond 84 days, or in a combined period of 140 days, if we have different periods of force majeure, then this gives rise to termination rights by either party, the employer and the contractor. Uh, and I, I want to come back to the, the distinction between force majeure uh, in England and in other jurisdictions, because it's funny when I discuss clause 19 of FIDIC with FIDIC with students, especially from civil law, they always get confused as to why force majeure needs to be provided contractually, because for them, as I said, it's, it's a legal concept that would apply anyway. But FIDIC had a specific understanding that needs to be contractually provided, that has caused quite a lot of confusion. And as I said, I had first kind of confusion with dealing with students. This is why the current 2017 edition of FIDIC 
has removed the reference to force majeure in what was clause 19 and it's now clause 18 and refers to exceptional events. All right, so, but it's the same. It's force majeure by any other name. So exceptional events under clause 18, now it is what it was previously clause 19 um, for the uh, 1999 fitting edition. And I've welcomed this amendment because I think it gets away, it does away with confusion and some baggages uh, that legal traditions, practitioners from legal traditions have. Now, apart from this change in the title, a little else has changed. So they, the current clause 18 also provides for the same two types of relief that I discussed previously, extension of time and cost uh, and possibility of termination for a force majeure event or an exceptional event that lasts more than 84 days. Since we're talking about COVID-19, the indicative events, I think, that are set in the new clause 19, and I think it's worth mentioning, do not include pandemic, right? So clause 18 has, by way of examples, some references to exceptional events, but this does not include pandemic. They include natural catastrophes, such as earthquakes, uh, or revolution, or riots, and strikes, but not COVID-19 and any pandemic or endemic situations. Now, of course, these events are set out by way of example, as I said, and it remains to the party that relies to the general provision defining an exceptional event, if they can prove that the event is A, beyond the party's control, B, the party could not reasonably have provided against before entering into the contract, C, uh, that this is the party that could not have reasonably avoided or overcome uh, the exceptional event, and D, that is not substantially attributed to the party that relies to the event. So, but this is a critical, I think, uh, importance um, to mention here that even if now the contractor proves that pandemic is an exceptional event, so it proves that all these four conditions apply, still the contractor may claim extension of time, but it will not uh, get associated costs. And this is because provision 184 of the FIDIC, the current provision 184, provides that if the contractor wants to claim an exceptional event that does not fall within the examples that are listed there, the examples that I mentioned, riot, rebellion, war, uh, earthquakes, and natural catastrophes, the contractor will get extension of time, but not prorogation costs. And I think that's a very important uh, limitation that contractors will have to be faced with because the contractors now, as we all know from experience, new cases come out from this pandemic, especially in the construction industry, construction industry, they face enormous costs of having to keep the payroll as it used, or at least under limited um, uh, workforce, but they still have to pay renting for, um, uh, for equipment. They still need to have um, to implement some new protocols. They face considerably costs during this pandemic, which under the current form of um, the requirement um, to, to be included the pandemic within the exceptional events that are listed specifically, they will not be able to, um, to reclaim that. And I think that's a shame for many contractors. Thank you, Stavros. That's very interesting, especially because it's a position distinguishable from Brazilian law, for example, in which there is uh, an article from the civil code applicable to construction contracts that allows the contractor to suspend the works in case of force majeure. We'll now start taking the questions from the audience. And the first question comes from Ham Al Sulamani. And his question is, to what extent should contracts basic elements, including formation, interpretation, termination, and renegotiation in good faith, 
be based on sound political, social, economic basis, with a view uh, as contracts being a foundation element of today's highly actually globalized world and borderless virtual reality. It may be highly time to reduce, if not eliminate, differences between jurisdictions via an overarching international instrument which sets out those contract bases. Is this something feasible? Why do you think? I'm, I'm happy to give a first go. You ask Felipe whether it is feasible. I, I have to ask a previous question whether it is desirable. Uh, I think the pluralistic approach to different uh, contracts, state contracts, state, I think that's uh, something that we need to welcome. Uh, obviously, uh, attempts for transnational approaches uh, are welcome and we need to, uh, to have a consistent approach. But I don't think that we need to eliminate any differences that different state laws have. First of all, it's impossible, right? I mean, different legal traditions uh, go stretch back to centuries. Uh, both if we talk about French law, Brazilian, German, and English, of course. It's impossible to do away with the legal tradition. But I would still think that it's not desirable because that leaves the parties with different ranges of options. So it's for them to choose whether in the contract world something different well, for English law or something that allows for more flexibility to take account of the social changes that are in the realm uh, made and go for different laws. So that's, that would be my answer. I, uh, if I can. Uh, add just a few comments. I fully share uh, your opinion, Stafos. I think, especially in contract and corporate law, regulatory competition is healthy. And it has been proven in various studies that it does not lead to uh, regulatory downsides by the contrast. It leads to improvement. And it's also what uh, is basically the backbone of international arbitration, party autonomy and contracting. So let the parties choose which law they prefer. But I want also to um, say one word, what I think is, is actually happening in huge international investment contracts like project finance. Uh, parties design contracts in such a way that they are basically autonomous from the underlying legal order. And they, of course, include interpretation clauses. They include a renegotiation schemes. They have cross default rules in order to get everybody on the table. So I think the, the solution is more in sophisticated contracting than in, in a multilateral new convention. Unfortunately, for other areas of international law, the times for multilateral uh, huge conventions are unfortunately gone in this moment, I think. There is no basis for that at all. Yeah, maybe if we have time, maybe I'll add something on, on stemming out of both what Stavros and Peter have just said. I think I, I share their, their, their preference for um, avoiding uh, complete universalism. It is, um, while laudable, um, I share Stavros's view that it is unachievable. Um, but, uh, but it is ultimately two things ought to be borne in mind. I agree with, with Peter that in practice, the relevance of this gets reduced by comprehensive drafting. Ultimately, uh, complex contracts, so whether we're in the construction realm, uh, and, and Stavros was mentioning fitted contracts, or whether we're in the energy realm, and, and Mayuda and Gloria were mentioning upstream agreements, downstream agreements, all of these contracts tend to be quite comprehensive in such a way that you can have a whole arbitration litigating a complex points of fact and law arising out of the dispute without ever resorting to the applicable law because the contract have not dealt with it. I'll caveat that with saying that the problem is, uh, and, 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 and Stavros alluded to the traditions under which some of these contracts were formed. So you get a fitted contract and, and as Stavros noted, that's a originally English law sort of instrument, or at least developed with English law in mind, that gets, let's say you're in the Middle East and you've submitted it to 
UAE law or Qatari law. Well, these legal systems have mandatory hardship provisions. So while the parties negotiating thought that they've done everything, at, you know, we call it the, 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 the midnight clause when you're just drafting the arbitration agreement and the choice of law clause and one party concedes, say, at the applicability of the local law. Now, a peculiarity of regional law in the Middle East is that you cannot contract out of hardship. You can contract out of hardship under French law, under many continental legal systems, but you cannot in the Middle East, which means that while you have all this sophisticated FIDIC system of balancing the risk, the applicable law comes in at the last minute and no one negotiating that contract thought of this. But it is a mandatory provision and it tells you, you cannot contract out of giving the judge the right to rebalance the contract. So, uh, and my last point on that is that whatever your applicable law, whatever your contract, ultimately one thing that governs all this is common sense. Is that, you know, the law is ultimately the alternative to, 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 to finding a solution. And, and whatever you do, if the cost of performance exceeds the cost of breach, the party will breach. If I'm going to lose $100 performing the contract and $50 in damages being sued, I will be sued. The English call that the efficient breach, but it's called, you know, it, it is just reality and it's applied everywhere. And that's sort of the final check on negotiation is that if everything else fails, you're just going to compare the cost of breach with the cost of performance. Um, Felipe, if I may add uh, something to Hannah's question as well. Um, I mean, I cannot stop thinking that we do have that. You know, we have uh, Execuit Bono, we have Lex Mercatoria, and arbitrators could somehow use that in the back of their mind, uh, or as Mohammed says, it's simply common sense. Uh, but I do think that the decision making process of the arbitrators. Um, it's well suited as to them to see what it fits and of course once the applicable law sinks that's what you have and that's what you have to do but I do think that and that is the reason I really like the interaction of the Unidraw principles which by the way very sophisticated uh, arbitrators and in very particular cases I have not seen in many investment uh, treaty practice but I have seen that interaction and that is what I, I highlighted the Unidraw principles so I do think there is some of that already existing um, and you don't really need to unify it all, but I, I, I don't think as well that we are totally naked. We do have some uh, infrastructure out there that supports perhaps uh, Hamid's uh, idea of a more international uniformity, if I may describe it like that. If I may add, uh, just a quick comment, more academic perspective. And uh, because you've covered almost all the issues, but uh, that's why we need to, on the one hand, acknowledge the importance of those international sources, as Gloria was pointing out. Uh, the last year, the Hague course, we had a brilliant uh, uh, international main course by Diego Fernandez Arroyo, the best representative of Latin Americans in Europe and in international law, which made his course on that topic. But on the other hand, the comparative law perspective, the comparative law education, nowadays, besides being international law professor, I'm an, a comparative law activist, because you do need to acknowledge the importance of the diversity. And we have Ralph Michaels nowadays, who is at Max Planck, he's also maybe a a fighter for this acknowledgement of legal diversity, and they have many projects going on there uh, of pluralism, but pluralism in the wider sense, because there is this strong process of Europeanization of private law, which was very important, very healthy, but nowadays we need to widen the scope. So it's very important to acknowledge the, the plurality. Thank you. Thank you, Mariuda. Sadly, our time is up. I'm thankful to Cam CCBC for creating this platform that brings people together and allow us to discuss ideas and exchange experiences. It is certainly more pleasant and easier to learn from people than to learn from books. And I'm also 
thankful to the speakers for accepting to participate in this project and for sharing their knowledge. Thank you very much. And hopefully the world will become a bit more normal soon. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe, for a great job as a moderator. And to everybody, and to Eleonora, Peter, and all the, the, the people from the Kansas CBC. Thank you to the audience, who, people who are bearing with us until now. Yes, thank you so much from my side as well. And once again, sorry for the delay at the beginning. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you all.